Welcome to Office 365, Is It Right for My Nonprofit? My name is Becky Wiegand, and I am an Interactive Events Producer here at TechSoup Global. I will do quick introductions, and then we'll have an opportunity to learn more about our speakers as we move through today's presentation. I've been with TechSoup for about five years, and have moved from being sort of the writer, blogger, who wrote about accidental techie experiences that I had at three small nonprofits, to now hosting webinars like this. We'll also be joined today by Linda Widdop, who is from Tech Impact, one of our donor partners. And she is located in Pennsylvania and helps nonprofits every day deal with their technology issues, including migrations to Office 365. Additionally, we'll be joined by John Corey, who is with the Tulsa Area United Way's NTech Collaborative, where they help all of the United Ways in the Tulsa area manage and utilize their technology to the best of their abilities. In addition, you'll see a variety of names on the back end. Gretchen Dio from Microsoft will be joining and answering questions, Ali Bazdikian, Ginny Mies, and Nielsen from TechSoup will all be on hand also to help field your questions. So feel free to post them in the chat window throughout the presentation. A quick look at today's agenda. We'll be spending just a moment looking at who is TechSoup in case you're not familiar with us. We'll have a quick poll. Then we'll introduce Tech Impact, learn a bit about Office 365, and then we'll get into some of the real meat of the presentation with hearing from Linda on tips about before you begin and other considerations to make before you migrate to Office 365. We'll hear John's case study about his experience migrating not only his own organization, but a variety of organizations to Office 365. We'll learn about the options available and how to get it, and then we'll spend some time in the Q&A. So we have a lot to cover. So I'll quickly buzz through what is TechSoup, who we are. We're part of TechSoup Global. We're working toward the day when every nonprofit library and social benefit organization has the technology, knowledge, and resources they need to operate at their full potential. Those, part of doing that is hosting webinars like this because really we're a nonprofit as well, and we want to make sure that you have the access to the donated resources and the information to make the best decisions for your organization's needs. This is a little bit about the audiences that we've served. We have partners in 56 different countries around the world operating similar programs under the TechSoup Global Network umbrella. And we have served more than 208,000 organizations worldwide. You can see a little bit more about our donor partners, which include companies like Adobe, Microsoft, Cisco, Symantec, and many, many others. So if you're not familiar with us, feel free to visit TechSoup.org to learn about the donations available to your nonprofit or charity. Now getting ready to hand off to Linda to take us through information about Office 365 and what Tech Impact does to help nonprofits migrate to it. Just to give us a little bit of background about yourselves, this will help us understand what type of organization you are. So can you click on the screen how many staff or volunteers or board members are using your systems at your organization right now? systems like email or shared files? How many people have access to your .org alias on their email right now? This will give us an idea of what size organizations are primarily joining us today. Because the experience, while very similar in a lot of tool availability, may be very different in the migration and considerations. You should be seeing that on your screen. I'll give just a few more seconds because we have about 30 people who haven't yet responded. But it looks like about 25% of our audience is from pretty sizable organizations. I guess I should have included 100 and more or 200 and more. If you're with a, a really bigger organization, feel free to chat that to us because there may be considerations that we could chat back to you that would be specific for your needs. And it looks like it's pretty evenly split between really small at the 1 to 5 level and moderately small. So we have Robert telling us that he's got an organization of 600, so that's a good-sized organization. 
So thank you for taking time to let us know your size. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Linda Widdop who is joining us from Tech Impact where she specializes in helping nonprofits every day in their offices, hands-on, tackle their technology needs, consulting over the phone, and in their own office space. Welcome Linda to the program. Thanks Becky. Hi everyone. Um, good midday to you all I guess I should say. We are, um, as Becky said, I am the Director of Technology Services here at Tech Impact. Um, I'm the one in the glasses and the collared shirt, not the one with the dog tags showing. That's our office dog, Roxy. She comes to work with us every day. Um, I work for Tech Impact. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Our mission is to ensure that all nonprofits can use technology to better serve our world. Basically, we do technology services for other nonprofits. Um, you can see by our photos here that you know, we, we are trying to convey the message that our clients are the ones that do the real work to save the world, and we just um, are in the background helping that along. So that's what we do. We are um, located in Philadelphia, established here in 2002 under the name NPower Pennsylvania. Probably some of you on the call today have had um, some experience with an NPower, maybe close to you, um, New York or Seattle or whatever. We, um, cha we changed our name this past February, I think, to um, Tech Impact, which kind of conveys what we do a little bit more. Plus, it allows us to offer our services more um, on a national scale and even international scale. We serve um, somewhere, somewhere around 500 organizations per year with services such as um, con technology consulting, um, managed support. We run a help desk for um, over 100 organizations and about 3,500 end users call us on a daily basis. Well, not all of them. Um, call us on a daily basis and ask us for help and support. My printer doesn't work, that kind of thing. Um, and we're really um, pretty expert now on Office 365. We've assisted over 500 organizations with some migration from whatever service they were using for email and file sharing over to Office 365. We've been doing this for almost four years now. So um, I think that's why TechSoup has asked me to, to talk to you today about Office 365 and, and what it's all about. So um, what is Office 365? Um, Office 365 is a suite of solutions that are hosted by Microsoft on Microsoft servers in Microsoft data centers um, with all of their security and all of their super technology um, that allows your staff to work wherever and whenever they need to work, which is um, a really huge thing. This is known as a cloud solution. And some of you have probably been on other webinars where you've heard myself or someone else talk about cloud services and what that means. It means that these services are delivered to you over the Internet. So all, all your staff needs is an Internet connection. That can be a PC. It can be a laptop. It can be a MacBook. It can be an iPhone or an iPad. It can be any Internet connected device you can get to your stuff. Um, so that's what cloud services mean. And this particular solution by Microsoft allows you to do these things. Well, it has these things included. Um, Office 365 allows your users, every user has a 50 gigabyte mailbox. That mailbox has spam and antivirus included in it. And it is a Microsoft Exchange mailbox. That Microsoft Exchange mailbox allows you to do more things with your email than you've been able to do in the past if you haven't been on an, an Exchange server. So it allows you to do, um, use Microsoft Outlook as your, web as your mail client, connect, create folders, store your mail, delete, whatever. And then if you're away from Outlook, and you have to get to your email from 
say an Internet browser, you type in www.office365.com, put your username and password in, and all the same stuff shows up. All your folders. If you've deleted an item, it's still deleted. New mail comes in, you still get it. The same thing happens on your phone. If you've got an iPhone, a smartphone, a Windows phone, an Android phone, you can actually attach that to your same Exchange email box and get the same emails. If you delete something, you read an email on your phone and delete it, it's gone. It's gone from your Outlook. It's gone from your Internet mailbox. It's gone because it's hosted at Microsoft in your Exchange mailbox. That's a really cool thing. Um, it also includes file storage and sharing through two different, uh, two different systems that Microsoft runs. One of them is SkyDrive Pro. Each one of your users gets a 25 gigabyte SkyDrive Pro account. That account allows them to synchronize some files that are on their computer, like for instance in the My Documents folder. That My Documents folder can be synchronized to their SkyDrive account, which means when they walk away from their computer, they go home or they go to another computer that's not theirs and they say, uh oh, I need to get to that file. No problem. They go to www.office365.com, put their username and password in, click on their SkyDrive, and that all that information is still there for them. If they make a change to the document on SkyDrive, when they get back to their computer the next day or after the weekend or whatever, open up their My Documents folder, they sync that, and all the changes are there. So that's their SkyDrive Pro account. You can also do, and, and that SkyDrive Pro account is really mostly for documents that you want for yourself or your staff wants for themselves. It's not really for um, full sharing to the organization. That's where SharePoint comes in. SharePoint is like an intranet website for your organization. It has, um, again, www.office365.com, put your username and password in, click on your team site, and what happens is it opens up an intranet. It looks like a website, and that website is broken up based on your needs to show different things. File sharing. You can put files right on SharePoint. You have a budget spreadsheet. Put that spreadsheet. It's a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. It's not a uh, doc online. It's a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Put that onto a file share. You can set permissions to that folder or that file just like you would on a regular network. Some people can access it. Some can not access it. Um, and it's all right there. It can, can be combined with, say, a calendar of events can be on the same page as that document so we can see all of that at the same time. That document can be opened and viewed online just right through a web browser. You can even edit that document in what Microsoft calls Office Web Apps. So you can actually have people editing Excel, Word, PowerPoint, OneNote documents right from a web browser, even if they're away from their office and they don't have, they're not at a computer where um, Excel is actually loaded. You can also edit that document in a full version of Excel, and we can talk about that um, later. So it also includes web conferencing. The web conferencing and instant messaging come from um, a system called Link. That's spelled L-Y-N-C. Link has um, the capability, Microsoft calls it presence management. It connects to your Outlook calendar, so it will let your coworkers know if you're available or not, if you're using your calendar and you've got an appointment scheduled. Your coworkers open link, they'll see you in red. Red means that you're unavailable for them. But it will allow you to chat your coworkers. This is a great tool for you to use. If you've got workers that are not all in the same building or all in the same section of a building and you want to just get some quick Q&A done, you know, hey, I have a quick question, you can go ahead and instant message that. So it's pretty cool. But it also allows you to do things like have w online web meetings. So you can send a meeting invitation and share your desktop with other people. So you can do that with other people you work with or 
anyone outside of your organization as well. This is great for things like board meetings. You know, we all have the same problem. You schedule a board meeting or a finance committee meeting, and two of them can't show up for some reason. No problem. You can share your screen out with those members, send them a link invitation. They connect, and they can see your screen. So if you need to go over the budget, they are actually seeing that screen right with you. In addition to that, it also includes um, HD video and audio. So you could actually have them see you, like, uh, kind of like Skype does it, um, and have them do that. So that's, the, that's what's included with Microsoft Office 365. I hope that some of you that are um, chatting or getting your, an your questions answered about the full version, um, we'll, there's another presentation in a few weeks about Office 365 and licensing and, and all of that. So I'm not, going to go, I'm not trying to go into a whole lot of that today. Suffice it to say, uh, I hope you can tell by my description, I love Microsoft Office 365 um, as a technologist, as a person who um, manages a help desk, that we have over 100 organizations that use our help desk. Three years ago, of those 100, we had 85 Exchange servers. In under management. Those Exchange servers were running our technologists, our technicians ragged. We had to worry about backups, updates, what happens if the hardware crashes, um, how can we get the, the email restored quickly and, and um, efficiently. Um, since Office 360, when, it, when I first saw the, my first demo of Office 365, I came back to my office and I said to the guys, we're not installing any more Exchange servers. In fact, we're going to convert everybody that we have to Office 365. This will give them better, uh, more updated services, bigger mailboxes, redundancy, backup, and uptime. And we don't have to worry about that. All of our clients, we have three Exchange servers in the field to date. Um, so out of the 85, we converted 82 of them right off the bat over to Office 365. Those customers are way happier. Their email doesn't break. They don't have to worry about upgrading. They don't have to pay for a new server. They don't have to pay for an upgrade. They don't have to do any of that. It just works. And that's why we love Microsoft Office 365 for our clients. Um, hey, Linda, in addition, we had one question. Yes, oh, sorry yes. to interrupt. We had one question come in that was just a clarification on the slide, um, asking uh -huh. from Lord. Lord is asking, is it 25 gigabytes of SkyDrive and 25 gigabytes of SharePoint, or 25 of both combined? No, it's. Thank you. It's a 25 gigabyte SkyDrive account. Each one of your users gets a 25 gigabyte SkyDrive account. SharePoint space is allocated by uh, Microsoft depending on how many users you have in a site collection. So it starts with 10 gigabytes, and then for every user you get something like 250 megabytes more, and that all adds up. Once you hit that uh, storage space, you can purchase additional storage on your SharePoint. And Microsoft's price for that is ridiculous. It's 20 cents per gigabyte per month. That is like ridiculously cheap for storage in any cloud server. So if you, have, if you start with 10 and you add another, say, 10 based on your users, you have 20. If you want to go over 20, let's say you need 50 more, 50 times 20 cents, quick, do the math. What is it, $10 a month? For $10 a month you get 50 extra gigabytes of space. This is space that you can store file documents in um, that you never have to worry about the backup of because it's all redundant from Microsoft. It's all protected from Microsoft. You don't have to worry about that anymore. So I mean, you can't get that. I don't know if you can get that anywhere else. It's a terrific price. Um, I hope that answered the question. So um, my job today is to talk to you about Office 365 and 
Office 365 is a, is a great platform, but there are some considerations that you should know about if you want to move to that solution. And that's what we're, um, I'm going to talk about for the next couple of slides. Um, oh, Becky, you have a poll slide here. So uh, go ahead and, and if you can, answer this question. Where is your email hosted now? Do you have an in-house Exchange server? Um, are you on Gmail, Webmail? Do you not know where your email is because you're not that person in your organization? So it looks like I have a lot. We have a lot of <laughs> we have a lot of Exchange servers out there um, that we would be happy to convert for you to Office 365. If you're already using an Exchange server at your office, um, you know that um, you already have a pretty robust email system. Of those Exchange servers, however, the Office 365 is on the very latest platform. So it's Exchange Server 2013 um, with all the, the new bells and whistles that come along with that. Um, most nonprofits that I deal with are probably at Exchange Server 2010 at the, at the latest, and a lot of them are on uh, 2007 or 2003 still. So um, Linda, George just reminded me that um, I didn't include an option on there for folks who are already using Office 365, so I apologize oh. for that lapse. <laughs> if you're already on it, feel free to chat yep. into us because you might be able yep. to share some tips or experiences that we can share out with the rest of our um, yeah. the rest of our participants today. Great, thanks, Becky. That <laughs> that was kind of a funny oversight, wasn't it? Um, so, uh, and then other people are on Gmail or Webmail. Those uh, people who are on a Gmail or a Webmail platform, your email experience is um, different whether you're in Outlook or you're, you need to get to your email through the web. Um, but again, I, this slide is just about your email. There are other features to um, Microsoft Office 365 that are really um, the next level. This is file sharing and collaboration, so, and, and the link platform as well. So great. So um, let's talk about what, to think, what should we think about before we begin this um, process of do we want to move to Office 365. Uh, understand your business needs. Understand the licensing and features of Microsoft Office 365. Again, there will be another webinar coming up shortly um, in the near future where a Microsoft person is going to go over all the licensing and features of Office 365 for you. But let's talk about your users. Do, do most of your users work in the same office? Do you have remote workers? Are workers only accessing your information via the web? Do you have workers who complain that they can't get to the information that they need when they're out of the office or they're working at a remote office? Um, do you have the kind of workers who are in the field all the time and need to only use mobile device because they're case workers and they're working at um, clients' homes or, or they're working at uh, shelters or something like that where they need to just use a mobile device. I think Office 365 is a good fit for those users um, and also for those remote, worker, uh, remote users. It's a good fit for the user. The user experience is let's all get to the same information at the same time rather than I'm saving it locally to my desktop and she's saving it locally to her desktop and now we don't have the same information. We can all get to the same stuff at the same time. Um, it's good from the IT person's perspective. We don't have to worry about VPN connections, making those, setting up the routers and all that stuff to make a, v a secure VPN so everybody can get into the same server. We don't have to worry about what happens when the server at the main office goes down and who's, you know, nobody can work, um, that kind of other thing. There are considerations that I'll talk about in a minute around. Um, what kind of worker or what kind of computer users you have, and how much training is needed. Um, 
know the technical requirements. Office 365 works best if your operating system is at Windows 7 or higher. Remember that Windows XP will be um, officially end of life I think in April of 2014. So if you are thinking of doing an Office 365 migration, you should probably combine that with an upgrade of your Windows operating system to at least Windows 7 if not Windows 8. Um, micro, the Office version, your Office version is best. Microsoft Office 365 works best when it is in combination with Office 2013 um, products. It works really well with Office 2010 products. It doesn't work as well. Some features will not work as well if you are at a lower version than that, 2007. Um, and I don't think 2003 is, is supported at all. So again, if you're, if you're considering moving to Office 365, now is a good time to also upgrade your Office version. Um, you can upgrade your Office version by um, going to TechSoup and you know, get, purchasing those licenses through TechSoup at, for the admin fee. Or you can use um, the E3 licensing in Microsoft Office 365 and subscribe to the Office 2013 platform through that. Uh, again, you'll learn more about that in the next um, webinar. What's your, current, what's your Internet connection, your bandwidth, your Internet speed? Um, you'll be doing a lot of work over the Internet, so you want to make sure that your Internet speed is, is there. It doesn't take much more to do Office 365 than to do your regular email now. But if you're going to move to SharePoint and link and do a lot of like uh, web conferencing over the link and everything, you want to make sure that you have enough Internet bandwidth there. Um, what is your so assessing your current environment? Will you need to have upgrades again? Are you at Office? Um, are you at Windows 7? Are you at Office 2010? For Mac users, you would need to be at um, if you want to use the full version of Microsoft Outlook as a web as a email client. You would need to be at Office 2011. If you want to use SharePoint documents, you definitely want to. Um, use Office 2011 as well. Considerations to, these are considerations. Plan for a successful project. This is going to be, you know, you're going to have a migration project on your hand. Whether you have five people in your office or you have 500 people in your office, there's going to be a migration that has to happen. So plan for a successful project. Um, we always recommend that you do your email migration first. Get that over with. Get your users acclimated to the things like the new Outlook version, the new web interface, and, and feel comfortable with that. And then do a very um, keep it simple SharePoint implementation. Use the, out of, use the templates that Microsoft provides you. Use the functionality that Microsoft provides you. Don't do any custom development and workflows to start. Let's get the users involved with using SharePoint the way it's meant to be, and their SkyDrive and their link. Um, provide multiple training opportunities. This is a big learning that we've come, we've come up with over the past three years. We need to do user training, and we need to retrain them. We need to give them multiple opportunities to go find out information because everybody, it's a new thing. Um, and then plan for change a lot resources. This is internal resources. You definitely need to have someone on the inside of your organization as the point person to help with the SharePoint implementation and the user questions and, and that kind of a thing. Um, so this is how we do it. We, um, we will work with you to understand your current environment. Uh, we can help you do that. There's a an Office 365 assessment that's available through TechSoup. Um, we'll talk to you and provide a quote for an implementation, um, an implementation project for that. We provide onboarding so, so, uh, services. We do that two ways. We do a full implementation project. If you're the kind of organization that doesn't have an IT person, on staff or an IT person who hasn't gone through this kind of a project before, we can 
get you a quote for a full implementation. We also would do a workshop series. The workshop series will allow you to join a web workshop once a week, and you will be in with other people from other organizations. And we will actually provide you the tools and materials that you need to actually do the migration and the SharePoint setups yourself. We also do ongoing support after the project is done. Um, we do web-based support or one-on-one -on -one support. We feel like that's pretty important for, especially if you're new to Microsoft Exchange or if you've never had a SharePoint experience before. A um, little bit, just uh, you don't have to read this now. You can read it later. Um, we've done a lot. Basically, this says we've done a lot of these things. Um, yeah, same thing. So uh, I want to wrap up real quick because I want to give John a lot of time to talk about his experience. Um, so thank you. I'll get on chat now. Thanks so much, Linda. So I'd like to take a moment just to introduce John Corey, who is joining us from the Tulsa Area United Ways and Tech Collaborative, where he helps manage a group of people that help the United Ways in the area update and maintain and advance their technology goals. And he's going to talk about their experience having moved to Office 365. So welcome John. We look forward to hearing about your experience. Hi everyone, and, and glad to be a part of this webinar. Um, if you Just a real quick introduction here, if that will move. There you go. Um, uh, Intech Collaborative's parent organization um, is the Tulsa Area United Way. We have 61 partner agencies in a six county area that deal in health and human services. Um, basically, they range from, gosh, we have agencies as small as one to two staff people, um, and agencies as large as 500. Or, or more. So we see a, a huge gambit of, of size and scope and sophistication as far as technology goes. We are all the time looking for nonprofit um, solutions uh, in the technology realm that, that, that are right size for our organizations um, and not necessarily just enterprise wide. Um, as you see, our agencies are busy. We have a lot of people in a six county area helping a lot of good folks here in, in, in the Tulsa area. Um, our mission is to assist our United Way and its partner agencies basically to make the most of technology. Um, and we do whatever we can. Here's a quick overview of our services. As you can see, we, we, we run the gambit, and in, in if it has wires in it, <laughs> they call us, and, and we like that. Um, we, uh, we are uh, continually in the training mode. Linda mentioned user training earlier. Uh, we run what we call learning labs that um, deal with commonly used applications, many of them in the Microsoft arena. Um, and we have upcoming learning labs in our Office 365 area. Um, if we look at the next slide, why we chose to go with Office 365. And when I say we, um, I, I'm talking about our, our United Way and, and particularly why Intech um, uh, has backed us as a solution. Um, we like to utilize the tools that we um, suggest for our partner agencies so that we can have personal experience with those and speak with, speak with authority and confidence about what we do. Um, if we look at our bullet points, User access and improved interface. Um, if you are used to an older version of Exchange, or if you are used to some other web-based emails, um, the new Office 365 interface is fabulous. Um, our users have, have adapted right to it. We came from a 2003 Exchange server environment. Um, so our, for instance, our OWA or our web access um, interface was not nearly as nice, nearly as functional as what we have now. Um, significant increase in user quotas. As Linda mentioned before, compared to our measly you know, 50 to 100 and for a big user 500 megabyte inboxes, um, this is like the world has opened up and uh, our users have quit having to delete emails and, and move emails into local stores and such. And that's just a, a really nice thing not only for the user, but for us as administrators to not have to police that all the time. Um, enterprise class components, again, you know, this, this is, these are the same um, enterprise level components that 
that um, the for-profit big boys get to use. And so whether you're a, a nonprofit of two people or a nonprofit organization of 500 or as in one case I think someone said they had 3,500 in their organization, um, you're going to see an enterprise level uh, class of components. Um, and as Linda mentioned, they, they just work. Um, disaster recovery, business continuity, um, we have been looking at that um, quite in depth here at the United Way through our um, RT committee. And this is one of our, our, our prime examples of how if we were not able to get to our building, if we were having to work from home or from our disaster um, recovery site, um, we can function as far as as far as our, our Office 365 functionalities, we can function just as well from our hot site location or from home as we can from the office. And that's really, really nice because guess what? It just kind of is the nature of a cloud provision like this. Um, so we feel really, really good about that part of it. Uh, simplified administration and flexibility, again, as Linda mentioned, Exchange servers, you know, they, they're great. but you know, they take a little bit of care and feeding. Um, they tend to take a, uh, quite a few resources. Um, you have to watch those resources and make sure that your Exchange server is running uh, effectively on the box you have it on. Um, you've got to update them. You've got to back them up. Um, and you, you have a different level of administrative interface just as you would with any server in a network. Um, with Office 365, the beauty of that is that's all on Microsoft's watch. They get to keep those servers just exactly how they should be, just exactly how they should be updated with all the resources that they need. They get to, they get to do all those chores that we had to do before. Um, on the other hand, we as administrators get to log into a, a, a very easy to use web interface um, and do all of those functions that we would have done on a box right here in, in our network. So we just see that as a real plus. It, it's easier to train someone else to help. Uh, you don't have to be the only exchange expert in the organization to make a change. Um, and yet it does have the same security password level uh, uh, permissions that keep the folks that know how to do that, able to do that, and the folks that are, are regular users out of that environment so they don't even have to be concerned about it. Um, that adds to that flexibility. At the United Way, we have, um, we have a cycle in, in our world so that during campaign time, which we are in now, um, we practically double our staff. So the beauty about this is adding those users and provisioning them with inboxes and giving them all of those tools is very, very simple and is log into the web interface and make it happen. Um, we set up um, shared um, emails. We shared up group, group emails. We actually book all of the resources in our environment um, through Office 365. Uh, so if someone needs a, a meeting room or even uh, to use our van, um, they can book those right on Office 365. And we have a gatekeeper in the organization that, that receives those requests and approves them. Um, low cost of ownership. Obviously, at, at, you know, at, um, thanks to Microsoft and, and, and their uh, benevolent uh, approach to nonprofits, uh, cost of ownership is, guess what, zero a month as far as what you're paying monthly, unless, of course, you need some additional storage space. And as Linda said, that is such a cheap thing that you, can't, you just almost can't compare having to, to maintain an exchange server um, with the costs that go with that to zero a month. It's, it's a wonderful donation that Microsoft has done for our nonprofits. Um, on that same note, one of the reasons that we felt good about this is you know, it's offered and maintained by Microsoft. Um, Microsoft, as far as we know, will be there for a long, long, long time. If Microsoft disappears, we all may have bigger problems than trying to figure out how to send email. We may be looking for shelter. I don't know. But, um, we felt good about Microsoft backing this and, and being there for the long run and providing the infrastructure um, and the support and the technology to keep this you know, as a vibrant offering for many, many years to come. Um, not, not to uh, leave out the implementation assistance that we got from our folks at uh, Friends at Tech Impact. Linda and her crew did an excellent job of helping us understand where we were going, what advantages it would bring to us, uh, what, 
what things we need to look at in our environment to make sure that we were um, we were going to make a smooth transition uh, to give us a good solid timeline um, and a project plan to uh, to do those things to get ready uh, and they were there with us every step of the way to, to help us make that happen so um, the implementation assistance from someone like tech impact if you haven't done this before can 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 be almost invaluable. Um, if we look at the way our project went, um, we were uh, on an Exchange server, uh, 2003, um, so it wasn't the most recent version as many nonprofits tend to do. We, we tend to, to run our machines until they drop. Um, and it was, it was basically satisfying the needs that our users were expecting at the time. Um, but uh, because it was an older box, and because of the size of our staff here, um, we decided to, um, to move forward in, in a different migration path than some larger organizations with newer versions of Exchange. Again, Tech Impact help us, helped us assess where we were, uh, what it was going to take to get where we wanted to be, um, and we looked at a, a good, we developed a good plan to do that. Um, Obviously, we did our own internal assessment of, of, you know, what are the pros and cons of this? What, 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 what does it cost to stay where we are? What will it cost to move forward? Not just cost in dollars, but in time invested, in user training, in, in, in organizational change management, which I might mention is often the, the missing piece that people leave out of a project plan. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at the nuts and bolts and looking at the cost and looking at the short and long term strategies from a technology standpoint. But we often miss the opportunity to really lead the change inside the organization. We had great leadership inside the United Way um, from the top down to uh, help our users embrace this change and look forward to the, uh, to the advantages that were going to come from it. Logistics and timeline planning, again, you, know, you just have to look at how long something is going to take and if you've, got the, if you've got the time and organizational structure to do that. For us, it turned out to be a, a, a very quick process and it didn't take a, a long time. Uh, I think from the time we made our initial DNS changes, which let Microsoft know that we were real and, and a viable uh, domain in which to, to connect to, to, to doing the migration and uh, following up with our users in, in a, in a, in a post-migration uh, approach, it was just about three weeks of real work. Um, so that, as you can see, is not a very painful process. Infrastructure review and discovery, as Linda mentioned, um, you'll need to look at your infrastructure. Um, we are uh, a mixed house here. We still have XP machines. Uh, we have Windows 7's machines. We have, I think, one Windows 8. Um, we're on a mixture of Office 2007 and 2010. Um, so we're not a textbook case of, of a migration, although I will say that um, as long as all of the updates, and I mean all of the updates are done, um, you can move into the email portion, the hosted exchange portion of Office 365. We're in the process now of upgrading the remaining XP machines that we have to Windows 7 and then some Windows 8s and then moving on to Office 2010 and, and 2000, or, or 2013. Um, Migration preparation, uh, again, that's part of what we did once we, once we understood the, the, the minimum requirements. We looked at each machine and did those upgrades, uh, those updates, upgraded the machines that would take it at the time, began to make plans for upgrades later, um, and, and just prepared our network to be a little bit different, uh, prepared to shut our Exchange server down, looked at how we might re reassign those those uh, network resources. Um, we also worked with our users to, to have them reduce their inboxes because the way we migrated was one user at a time and uh, that, that made that process go incredibly quickly and very simply. Um, so so a, a user prep before the migration is really helpful. Um, if you've done like us and you, you had very strict inbox um, quotas, that might not be a big problem for you, but if you have some if you have some users that treat their inbox like their garages and they fill up and they fill up and you give them more space, you'll want them to back those inboxes down at least temporarily when you make that migration. Um, communications to the user base. Um, uh, I and my coworkers did a good job of um, 
talking about what we were about to do, sharing good news about that. Our leadership did a great job of communicating that to their departments. Um, and, and that, as I mentioned before, it, we think is a really important part of a technology migration. Um, migration launch, uh, we talked about those, those D initial DNS settings. Uh, they're simple to do, and, and folks like Tech Impact can guide you through that. The IT prep that we talked about, the final DNS settings, which is saying, okay, we're pointing our MX records at, at Microsoft and all of the other settings that they require for, ho for hosted exchange to do its work, as well as in the future SharePoint and Link. Um, those need to be made. Uh, we did those over a weekend to make sure that they all settled in and we could test them a bit, um, and they happened without a problem. Um, user account migrations, that can happen Exchange Server to Exchange Server. There are tools that, that, that can make that um, a fairly straightforward process if your Exchange Server is, is uh, a fairly recent version. Um, there are even tools that will allow Gmail um, migration as well. We found that for the size of our organization, our 26 to 50 users internal, doing those one at a time, uh, exporting that PST file, uploading that PST file to the account um, on Office 365 was really, really straightforward and simple and did not really take us very much time. Um, user follow-up and troubleshooting, as with any change, you know, there are things that you think happened that didn't happen. We had a few of those updates I mentioned not really happen all the way. Um, there's, there's a .NET set of updates that build on each other, and it's easy to get the first one and not the remaining ones. And so we had a little bit of that. Um, but really, once we got the machines where they should be, um, every, everything just came into place. Um, then we followed up with communications to the user base about, you know, here are new features for you. Here are some things that you want to explore. Um, please let us know if you've got problems, um, and and try to keep a little bit of enthusiasm amongst the user base about where we were going with this new tool. So that's just a real quick kind of fire hose blast about our particular experience and, and some of the quick lessons that we learned. Um, and then I think uh, it's time to turn this back over to Becky about how to get this great tool. Great. Thank you so much for that, John. Your experience is really useful knowing that you implemented it for really small organizations and smaller offices and also much bigger ones and sort of the bumps along the way for both of those. But three weeks is a pretty quick turnaround, so that's impressive. All right, so before we get to the many, many questions, I'm going to just talk really quickly about how to get it. So it is available to 501c3 organizations. It has been launched by Microsoft in more than 40 countries. Um, so this is available to nonprofits outside of the United States as well in those countries, and they are going to continue to expand it. Um, there is donated enterprise version, which is called E1, or the discounted upgrade to enterprise. And the biggest difference as far as I can tell <laughs> is that the donated enterprise version does not include Microsoft Office Suite applications. You can continue, which I broadcasted this out, that you can continue to request the donated Microsoft Office applications for your desktop through TechSoup's donation program with Microsoft, and go forward with the free donated enterprise version directly through Microsoft. Or you can do the discounted upgrade to the enterprise version, and that costs $450 per month per seat. So that's per user essentially to have access to the latest version of Office. Um, so those are the couple of options, and they offer unlimited seats. This is really a huge, huge donation to the sector. So you know, we are not trying to sell you on it because it's already um, a really great boon for organizations if they can make use of it for themselves. Um, and then how to get it. You visit Microsoft's site. This link is here, and we'll include it in the follow-up email afterwards. Just Microsoft.com slash Office 365 Nonprofits. And you sign up for a free trial. Even if you are already using Office 365 with a commercially purchased version, you can still sign up for the free trial. And then you can also view the Office 365 options in more detail and a better comparison there. Um, I link to an article in the additional resources in a moment that also has a comparison chart showing you the differences. After 30 days of, in, of being in that trial, or sometime during that period, 
TechSoup's role is to validate that you are actually eligible to receive this donation. And the eligibility requirements are very similar or maybe even exactly the same as the other Microsoft donation program requirements through our donation program with Microsoft, though this is only available for nonprofits. So if you are a public library that maybe is, has been eligible in the past, that may not be the case for this product. So what we do is in that 30-day trial, we verify that you are eligible or not. And then you transition from that free trial to the donation or discount that you've requested directly through Microsoft. So we aren't actually doing much of anything except confirming that yes, you are able to get it. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into questions. And we have a lot of them here. So let me just pull some of these up. We had a number of questions about HIPAA compliance, and I think that um, Gretchen from Microsoft posted a pretty good response about being up to standard with HIPAA compliance. But you know, Linda, maybe you could tackle that a little bit as well because technically if the software is HIPAA compliant, it doesn't make a difference if you do non-HIPAA compliant things with your data. <laughs> so maybe you could address that quickly. <laughs> Sure, that is correct. Yes, the, the Microsoft Office 365 offering um, meets HIPAA standards, but that just because they do doesn't mean you do. You still have to have the policies in place in your own, own organization to say we won't email client information or you know that kind of stuff out to people that we don't know and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we won't download our information from our SkyDrive and send it to our brother-in-law you know, who doesn't work for the organization or something like that. Um, I will say that there are, um, there's a third-party encryption tool that's available as well. If, you're the kind of, if you have the kind of users in your organization that really need to send information about like, like let's say um, a child welfare case or something like that out of the organization, for I think it's $1.88 per user per month, you can add this to your Office 365 account, and that will send those emails encrypted, end-to-end -end encryption for that. Um, I think you can find information about it on the website as well. Great. So we have people also asking questions about Microsoft Office and whether they need to still have that installed on their desktop or if they get Office 365, does it include that? Can you speak a little bit to that? Maybe Linda, this is a good one for you as well. Ask me that again. I was reading a chat question. <laughs> Sorry, no problem. Um, well, we had a number of folks asking about whether they still need to get Office, Office Suite, the Productivity Suite, mm -hmm. installed mm -hmm. locally on their desktop, or if, if this donation program just includes that, or how that works. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you, can, you can do that either way. If you are on an E1 license with Office 365 and you want to use Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, those programs, then you would want to install those locally on your desktop. Um, but if you were on the E3 license, the E3 license comes with uh, Office 2013 Professional uh, Professional with a subscription model. What that means is that each user who has an E3 license can download um, Office 2013, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, right onto um, up to five devices. So they can have it at home and they can have it at work. They can have it on their laptop. They can have it on their uh, Mac. It will download uh, Office 2011 as well. And you can download these programs on the go too. So if you find yourself at a place or a, and you're at your mother-in-law's house and she doesn't have Microsoft Excel loaded, why would she? She's retired. No problem. Get on her machine, log in, download Excel, do your work, and, and you're done with it. So that's a really great um, feature of the E3 license with the subscription to Office 2013. It also gives you the latest version of Office all of the time, which is a great thing. Or, you know, um, it, it's a, yeah, so it's a good thing that if you want that kind of thing as well. Becky, okay. And does it include, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. I might mention that, that um, I actually forced myself to close my Outlook and just work off of the Office 365 um, web, web environment. Um, and I have to tell you that 
it's really functional. It's it's very it's a very attractive interface. It it's it's intuitive. Um, they've done a good job of engineering it, and uh, you know, if, especially if you weren't an Outlook power user, or maybe your organization didn't really use Outlook that much, you won't. You'll just go right into this great functionality, and even if you are an Outlook user, you may find everything that you were doing in Outlook right there available for you on the web interface. So. For remote users or, or, or users that, that are in different places at, at, at one time, um, that web interface is really a, a rich environment. That's great. So we also had a couple of people asking about some of the Office apps. So is Access available in Office 365 or Publisher, some of the other ones that might be available in Office Pro installed on your desktop? Can they access those too, or would they still need to have that desktop version installed? So and I think that's a you. Yeah. So they need to have Office installed locally if what? If they have um if they need access or publisher, some of the programs that are included in the pro versions that they can get through TechSoup's mm -hmm. donation program, mm -hmm. are those included in Office three sixty five mm -hmm. as well? I don't think so. I think it's a Word Excel PowerPoint Outlook OneNote. Okay, so if you're using some of those other programs and they're pretty mission critical or useful mm -hmm. for you a lot, then you may be best off sticking with the donation program through TechSoup um, that Microsoft offers, which also includes the software assurance that allows you to upgrade for no cost every within two years of requesting that donation. So even though Office 365 continually updates you to the most recent version, you can also do that, but it's a more manual process through the donation program with TechSoup for the desktop installed version if you need it. Oh, and we actually got a message from Jane at Microsoft saying actually all are included. Oh, and she's are. included a link that we'll, we'll send back out to you. So that was a mistake on our end that we will have um, that to share so you can see everything that's included in the nonprofit plans including access apparently. So that's great. So other questions here. Um, we have a lot of people sort of wondering what the cost is to do a migration, and I can say pretty confidently that it's going to depend on so many different factors that I would really recommend talking to an organization like Tech Impact that's also a nonprofit and works with nonprofits about um, you know, doing the $10 assessment with them. Or we also have a list of consultants that we've vetted and worked with before through TechSoup that you can talk with that also work specifically with nonprofits where they can talk to you about your individual situation and give you a better idea of what the cost would be if you need to do this with an outside consultant or don't have internal staff that can help you do it. We are just at the top of the hour. So I know folks are still answering questions in the chat for you. So I will let them continue doing that while I just show you a couple of last slides with some additional resources. These links here are Microsoft's landing page for the Office 365 Nonprofits Program, information about how to use it and roll it out for admins, the User Adoption Learning Center, which is more for your staff who would be using it at the end of the day. And then we also have an article that Ginny, who has been on the back end helping with chat questions, wrote, Are you ready for Microsoft Office 365 for nonprofits? And that includes information about both of the, both of the offers that are currently available and their benefits, lists out their programs available, and also gives you that comparison chart that shows you what's included in the E1 or E3 versions. That said, I'd like to say thank you so much to our presenters. We will have a third webinar on Office 365 that we can include information and send that out to you in case you're interested in learning more about the different options available and the pricing differences, licensing info, and more about how to get it. So you will receive this email and this presentation later on today. So look for your email if you want to listen again. Thank you so much to John and to Linda, and for everybody on the back end helping to answer questions, including Allie, Ginny, Gretchen, um, and Nielsen. So thank you all so much, and have a terrific day. <laughs>